Thank you everyone for coming to this talk. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Stellard. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, and also I am the uh, community uh, stable release maintainer for the LVM project. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how you can uh, build your products around the uh, official LVM upstream releases. And the main reason I wanted to give this talk today is because I sort of wanna encourage people uh, to get more involved in the LLVM releases. I know that uh, there's a lot of different companies and a lot of different projects out there that use LLVM, and uh, even a great number of those are doing their own packaging, have their own release process. Um, and I see there's a lot of room for all of us to sort of collaborate and maybe uh, save some work. I know in my position at Red Hat, uh, I, part of my responsibilities are to package LLVM and Clang and the related tools for Fedora, uh, and I also I work on packaging them for the uh, upcoming LLVM toolset that will be available for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So I'm sort of very involved in this area in, in my uh, day job, and I really think if we work together, we can sort of make the situation a little bit better for everyone. So I'm just gonna go over a little bit of uh, how we can all do that together. So why should you participate in the upstream release process? Well, the really obvious reason is just to avoid reinventing the wheel. So if you can take what we're doing upstream as far as bug triaging, um, regression testing, uh, backporting fixes, if you can take that and incorporate that into your own project, uh, that's just gonna save you a whole lot of work. So that's, that's a big advantage. Uh, another reason is when you're participating in the upstream process, you have access to the code owners and subject matter experts um, when you wanna backport a fix or uh, have a question about a bug because this is uh, all sort of built into our release process. So this is actually really valuable because sometimes, for example, we'll have someone uh, who wants to get a bug fix in the official release and they'll, they'll run it by the code owner and the code owner might say, hey, you know, that's a good idea, but we actually had to revert that fix a couple days later. So what you really wanna do is take the second version of that PAX because the first version has this and this and bug. So those, that kind of helpful information that you can get from the code owners and or other people uh, can save you a lot of time and it's just really useful. Um, and you really, if you're sort of working on your own and your own release process, it's kind of hard to get the attention of these people because you know, they're really busy. Um, I guess maybe if uh, you know, you're paying them to work on LLVM, then you can get a little bit of access, but um, you know, they can't be helping out every individual project uh, that is doing a release. So um, just by participating in the upstream, process, you know, they only have really to do their job once, uh, and then we can all sort of benefit from that, which is, is kind of nice. And the other thing is uh, being involved with the release process is just a really good way to contribute to the, pro the project if you can't submit code. So let's say you have uh, out of tree proprietary backend, or maybe you have some code you're working on that is not really ready to upstream yet. Um, you know, you can still participate in the project um, with the releases, you can file bugs, you can help do testing, um, you can help uh, recommend things to be backported uh, into the stable releases. So it's just another good way for you to be able to contribute to the project uh, if you can't contribute code. So as far as who can get a benefit from our upstream release process, um, really I think anyone can benefit even if you aren't really uh, aligned with the upstream schedule or if you do things kind of your own way or on your own schedule. Um, you know, clearly if you are able to completely align yourself with Upstream, you're gonna get a lot of benefits. You're gonna get basically all the back ports for free. You're gonna get a lot of testing for free, and that's gonna be really uh, beneficial to you. Um, but even if you're on your own schedule, uh, I really think there are um, some advantages. You can sort of use the Upstream process. Um, it's sort of like a database of information uh, that you can kind of pull from. Uh, and the other thing you can do is you can sort of do a hybrid of both. Maybe you can start out aligned with the Upstream process, and then later on, if you wanna go your own way, you can do that as well. So I think pretty much no matter what your strategy is uh, in terms of releases, I think um, we can all, or anyone can really sort of benefit from you know, helping out and getting involved uh, with what Upstream is doing. All right, so let's jump right in and, and take a little bit closer look at our releases and, and how they work. Uh, so in the LVM project, we do time-based releases. So uh, we never wait, you know, it's not we're gonna do a release once we have feature X, Y, and Z. Uh, we pick a date, we do a release on that date, and if you wanna get a feature into the release, uh, you know, it has to be done uh, by that date. So up here on this slide, um, I have compiled what are approximate average release dates for the past couple years of releases. Uh, I'll note the disclaimer that 
Sometimes uh, the releases are late, so this is not a commitment or anything like that, but this is just sort of a general idea of when our releases happen in the LLVM uh, project. And we've actually been pretty good about being consistent about this for the last few years, so uh, I think these dates are pretty reliable, um, but of course you know, they may slip a little bit. Um, so generally there are two sort of release cycles throughout the year, um, so the first one kicks off uh, beginning of January, where we create a new stable branch, um, and then we do two releases off of that. We do uh, what's known as our major release, which would be like 4.0.0, 5.0.0, uh, and then after that we do what's called a stable release, which will be 4.0.1, 5.0.1. So we have two of these cycles throughout the year. Like I said, uh, the first one starts in January, the second cycle uh, starts in July. <laughs> All right, so if you look a little bit closer at, at some of the specifics of the release life cycle, um, so the, the major releases and the stable releases, uh, they're pretty similar, but they have some small differences. Uh, I think the main one uh, for the major releases is that uh, we have a different release manager. Uh, Hans is the re release manager there, so he's sort of the contact point uh, for those releases as far as coordinating and choosing the schedule and things like that. Um, so the major releases start out, we create a release branch, uh, and when we do that, development continues uh, on the master branch, uh, which is some people also refer to as uh, tip of tree or, or top of tree. Um, so that doesn't really, creating the branch doesn't really impact at all the development that's happening on master, that just sort of continues as normal. Uh, and then as we find uh, bugs in the release branch, uh, we start to cherry pick uh, fixes that, that we need from the master branch over to the release branch. Um, and, and go through a cycle of release candidates. So we do some stabilization work, do a release candidate, do which, um, we send out to users who can do a little bit more extensive testing. They give us feedback, and we sort of iterate, um, hopefully only a few times, uh, until we can get to the point where things are pretty stable and we can do our uh, final release. Uh, so for the stable releases, which are, like I said, are you know 4.0.1 or 5.0.1, um, so I'm the release manager for those. Um, pretty similar, pretty similar cycle. Um, so right after the major release, we basically start the process of looking for bugs, backporting fixes, we start that all over again, um, and sort of the, the same process. Um, the one really important difference about the stable releases is that we have an extra constraint on the type of changes that we accept. So any change that we accept into the branch have to be API and ABI compatible, so I'm talking about the, um, the LVM API or like the Clang API that needs to be compatible with our major release because that's one of the guarantees we have is in these stable releases you're going to be able to use them as drop-in replacements um, for the major release. So we, we need to make sure to maintain that uh, compatibility. So that's really the, the major difference and then after that it's still sort of the same cycle of you know, doing release candidates, finding bugs, fixing bugs, um, etc. So pretty similar but just that one kind of important difference. All right, so that's a little bit about the release process. So I'm not gonna talk a little bit about how you can use that to your advantage and help to make your, your product a little better. So in order to do that though, you really have to start way before the releases. And, and I think the first important step of that is making sure your development is aligned with upstream. So this means that uh, whatever your local branches are, whatever local code that you're working on uh, is very close to tip of tree. And I could really spend a whole talk just going over the best way to do that, um, best practices and things like that, but luckily someone has already done that, so I really encourage everyone to take a look at the uh, talk from the 2015 Developers Conference that I have up here. Um, really good talk about how to work upstream, uh, what processes you can use, um, and, and just generally pretty useful. I will just summarize a few of the most important points here, um, but basically you really want to do your feature development upstream um, and then when you can't do that, you want to make sure that you're merging upstream down into your local branches pretty frequently. Um, and you almost, it's pretty much a requirement that you have some kind of continuous integration if you want to make that work. So um, just kind of merging all, all that stuff together uh, is pretty important. And the reasons that you want to do that, um, I think probably the most important reason to align yourself with upstream is you can get really quick turnaround on regressions. So, uh, if you're you know, merging tip of tree every day, uh, you find a regression, if you report that right away, the LVM developers are pretty good about you know, either fixing it quickly or reverting the patch while they investigate. 
Um, and this is really valuable because this is the kind of thing that takes up a lot of time uh, when later on when you're ready to stabilize uh, whatever release you have. And even for a developer that committed the fix, if you wait two or three months to report it, they may have paged that out of their, their head. They may not have time to work on that anymore. So it's a little bit harder to get their attention if you wait. But if you can do it right away, um, usually you can, you can get pretty good feedback on that. And that is actually really important. So another reason you want to align with upstream is just to keep up to date with the API changes. I mean, that's one of the, the biggest cause of breakages for people who are merging in. So um, you know, just want to be able to keep up to date with that, see what the changes are. Um, and even, you know, it's sort of similar to the, what you get when you're reporting regressions. You know, if someone does an API change that maybe doesn't work for you or you don't, you, know, you think maybe there's a better way, you can catch it right away and you can actually reply to them and say, hey, you know, let's try and rework this a little bit that fits my needs a little bit better. And maybe you can actually get that fixed and save yourself some um, headaches uh, in, in the merge process. And the other thing is it, you, just get all, you just get to take advantage of the new features when you're um, pulling in the upstream changes regularly. And this is important because it gives you more time to test the new features. Uh, you get benefit of, of the new features and um, you know, whether it's performance improvements, uh, compile time improvements, uh, you can get those right away, take a look. Uh, and that's, that's also something that's really valuable. Right. Um, okay, so once you've aligned your development with upstream, uh, what you want to do to get started uh, leveraging the actual re release process uh, is you first need to understand how the process works. So hopefully by the end of this talk, that's something uh, you all uh, understand. Uh, if you don't, just ask me questions. Um, once you have that, you really need to do a cost-benefit analysis for your project. Um, so like I said before, you know, if you're able to align your development with the upstream release process, there's a lot of benefits that come with that, but there may be some costs um, due to uh, internal deadlines that you have or other constraints. So you really need to take a look uh, and come up with a release plan that is right for you. Um, so this is probably going to be different on every organization, but I think it's really a good idea to sit down and sort of figure out how can I get the most out of the upstream uh, while still satisfying some of my internal requirements. Okay, so I've sort of broken the release process up into these six phases, and I'm going to just go through and talk about what you can do in each phase uh, to help out your, pro your project um, and, and get the best use out of what we're doing upstream. Um, so this, these six phases cover both the um, major release and also the stable release. Uh, so just go from the beginning when the branch is created all the way to the final uh, release candidate of the stable release. So phase one uh, is when the release branch is created. Um, so after it's created, uh, it's open for cherry picks um, from the master branch. Uh, we just have a few rules. Uh, first of all, the commit has to be in master uh, before it can be backported. Uh, obviously, later on in the process, there may be some exceptions to that depending on what happens. But 99.9% .9 of the time, the fix has to be in master for first before we're, we would allow it into a release branch. Um, it also needs to be approved by uh, the code owner and also the release manager. Um, and at this point, really no large new features. Um, sometimes it's okay if you're finishing something up to get it in, but it's really up to the discretion of the release manager. And it's generally, if you're working on a new feature, you really should try and get it in before the branch creates because pretty quickly we, we clamp down uh, and get even more strict about the um, commits that we allow into the release branch. So once you have decided that you want to get a fixed in the re release branch, there's a pretty simple process you have to go through. Um, the first thing is you just want to make sure that the fix that you um, are, want to backport applies cleanly to the master branch and also passes all unit tests. Um, this is something you know, the release manager or someone else might be able to help you with, but if you can do this work up front, it really saves a lot of time and sort of increases the odds that your fix is going to, is going to be able to get in. Um, because the more you can do to make it easier for other people, the, the better chance um, it has of, of actually going in. Um, so once you have that, you have to get approval from the release manager and also the code owner. So there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, you can reply to the commit email on LLVM commits and just CC the code owner uh, and also the release manager. Um, you can also file a bug on the LLVM bugzilla um, and just mark the bug as a blocker for, we, we create like a meta bug 
uh, for the release. So you just mark it as a, as a blocker of that meta bug. Uh, and there's actually a really nice script in tree that you can use uh, if you want to merge a change um, into the release branch. So what that script does is it just automatically creates a bug for you um, with all the right fields filled out um, so that the code owner, whoever, it's, it's ready for them just to look at and approve. So I, I recommend using that if you can. Um, and the other thing you can do is if there's an existing bug that you're looking at, maybe it's been fixed in master, um, you can just mark that as a blocker for the, the release meta bug. Um, and also, don't forget to move it from um, closed back to open. Um, that's just another uh, thing you can do if uh, you have a fix that you want to get in. Okay. So now, specifically, how can you, how can you re what can you do at this part of the release process to sort of help your own project? Um, so I, this is a good time to create any sort of internal release branches that you want to. Um, if you look at if you if you want the the talk I, I mentioned earlier, if you go in and look at that, it has um, strategies for creating your own internal branches. And I think uh, when the release branch is, is created, you just want to follow those same strategies. But instead of tracking master, you're now going to be tracking the upstream release branch. Um, and I think even if you even if you don't think you're going to have any extra commits that we don't put in the upstream release branch, I think it's still a good idea to try to do this. Um, it's it's sometimes nicer if you have CI to have a local branch that might help speed up the clone times uh, if you're running a lot of tests. Um, also, it just gives you the flexibility if you decide at some point you need to pull in a patch that we can't get upstream. Um, it just, it's just nice to have. So I recommend setting up a, an internal branch just to track the upstream release branch. And then also make sure that your CI or whatever other testing you have uh, is enabled on the your internal release branch. All right, so moving on to the next phase. So once we uh, enter the release candidate phase, um, we, like I said, we clamp down a little bit on, on which commits can go in. So pretty much the same as before. Can't be a, there has to be a cherry pick for master, needs to be approved. Um, but really, if the, once we start a, the release candidate, there's no more new features. And especially after RC2, really only critical bug fixes because we, one of the things I've, I've learned while doing these releases is it's really important to have very strict guidelines for uh, when you're gonna stop accepting certain kind of bugs because otherwise you can sort of get into this endless release cycle where it's just, oh, we have this one more bug we need to get in and then one more bug we need to get in. So we try to be pretty strict to, to cut down on the number of release candidates we have to go through because every release candidate is just extra work for um, the testers and, and our users. So we try and, and, and cut that down. Okay, so for this phase, what you can do to sort of help your own release, um, once the release candidates start going out, this is a good time. If, if you're trying to align with upstream, uh, if you're trying to align your own process with upstream, this is a good time to run your um, larger test suites on the release candidate code, because these are sort of more stable, um, and because it's, you know, release candidate, we aren't constantly adding new commits to it. It's something that's, um, not going to change. You have more time to run these longer tests, so that's that's something that you can do. Um, when you find issues, report them, uh, you know, upstream to Bugzilla. Um, and also, another thing you can do at this point in the process is just start tracking tip of tree and see what commits are going in there. If you see a bug fix that you think may affect you, but maybe you haven't hit that bug yet in your testing, you know, it might be something just to keep an eye on uh, because you might want to just sort of preemptively backport it or ask that we, we get it upstream um, just to be safe. And so these things, these are things you can all do if, if you're aligned with upstream, but even if you aren't, I think this is, uh, is a really good time to, to get involved and sort of start tracking the upstream process because like I mentioned before, it's, it's just a really good database of information for you so you can sort of see what commits are going in, you know, even which ones are getting rejected from going in and why they're getting rejected. Um, this is all really important information. Uh, now that we're using uh, Bugzilla a little bit more to track this stuff, um, it's, it's right there for you and a little bit easier uh, to find. And you can even use some of the Bugzilla query features to see um, which changes have been marked as blockers that have been fixed, so you can kind of get an idea. It's, it's a little bit easier to fi figure out what's going in and, and what, it, what isn't, so uh, just a lot of really valuable information for you uh, and, and your release process. All right, and just uh, some other general tips for writing good bug reports, um, and these are whether or not you're 
requesting that um, whether or not it's a bug report for a commit that you want merged, or maybe it's just a regular bug that you want fixed before the release, uh, you should really always CC the release manager and the code owners on, on the bug. Uh, this is really the, the best way to get people to look at it. Um, I, when I go through the Bugzilla a lot, a lot of the times I have to add, manually add CCs to the code owner, and that just kind of delays the time that they have to look at it. And, you know, these people, the code owners are busy, you know, everyone's really busy, so the sooner you can get um, something in front of them, uh, the better chance you have of them actually taking a look. So this is actually really important that uh, when you, whenever you file a bug, you're just CCing the correct people so the right people are able to look at it. Also, really valuable to provide an LLVM IR test case. This is sort of the this is sort of the currency of developers because we all sort of have our own different projects, but that may you know involve Swift or Clang or whatever. But we all sort of speak the same LLVM IR language, and also this is something that we can test and debug without necessarily needing um, specific hardware. So this is really the best case scenario if you can get an LLVM IR test case. Um, that's, that's great for, for your bug report. And also, the smaller the better. Um, and when you do file these bugs, just make sure that you include the revision number um, and the, the git hash that you're using. This is pretty important just in case the bug's been fixed um, or some, some other reason. It's just helpful for, you know, maybe someone wants to reproduce it. Uh, just really useful information to have. All right, so uh, moving on a little bit further into the uh, release cycle. So, Phase three I call the, basically the, we'll say 4.0.0 release and when the 4.0.1 cycle begins. Um, so at this point we've, we've done our uh, major release and now we're starting again um, to work on the stable release. So I think this is a really good time for you to start getting um, feedback from users uh, because the, the main release is really stable. I mean this is sort of our best product out of the, the first part of the, the release process. So if you have any kind of additional testing, you wanna get users to look at it, this is really the right time to do it. And also it's a good time to take a look at which fixes uh, that you may want to uh, include in your release that didn't make it into the upstream release for some reason, whether uh, it's deemed too risky or there just wasn't time to get it in, just to go through that list because maybe there's some that you can uh, roll in uh, to the stable release uh, when it happens. Okay, uh, so phase four is the first release candidate of the uh, stable release. Um, so at this point, it's, it's basically pretty similar to the, the previous release candidate cycle with the, the major releases, and this is a time to you know, do a full test suite run, um, report issues on, on Bugzilla. Um, just the, the same thing you're doing uh, with the main release, um, you can also do it uh, with the stable releases as well. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention, so I, I, I said before how for the, the stable releases, you know, everything has to be ABI API compatible in order for the change to go upstream. Um, now I realize for a lot of users, maybe not everyone cares about that. Maybe, maybe you just want to use Clang and you don't really care about the LLVM API or, or using it as a library. Um, so this is something that, this is another reason to keep an eye on um, what's going on upstream and, and even if, you have a patch, you know it breaks the, the API and it's something you know won't get in. It doesn't hurt to just ask someone and say, hey, uh, I, I'm gonna file a bug for this. You know, I know it breaks the API, but what do you think? Is this something that's safe? Uh, maybe you can get someone to look at it um, and maybe that can be useful to other people who maybe don't care, care quite so much about the, the API or ABI stability uh, that we, we guarantee for the stable releases. Right. Uh, so the fifth phase um, is sort of the final merge request window. Um, so this is really your last chance to get a fix into an upstream release. Um, so at this point in the release process, uh, you really want to start wrapping up any sort of bug, bug triage or investigation you are doing. Uh, if you have something critical that you really, really want fixed, but you don't think you're going to be able to submit it um, in time for the deadline, uh, just let someone know, like contact me uh, or whoever the release manager is for that release uh, and just say, hey, I have this bug, uh, I really want to get it fixed. If it's something that's really critical and, and maybe other people are interested in getting it fixed too, um, you know, maybe it's something we can get in. So it never really hurts to ask 
uh, if you aren't sure whether or not something can go in, because the worst that's going to happen is we're going to say no, and then at least there's a record for it for other people um, if they're interested in, in that commit. Okay, uh, and then the final phase of the release process is just the final, I guess it's, it's pretty much the, the, the final release candidate of um, the stable releases. So this is kind of our, hopefully, what will become the final release. Um, so again, you wanna make sure you're running your full test suite on these, just like you're doing on the release candidates uh, for the major releases. Um, if you find anything critical, please report it, um, because like I said, if there's something super critical, we, you know, we may do another release candidate for it, um, but we, we really would like to know about it. Uh, so just to summarize a little bit, so just at a high level, some of the things I've talked about, ways you can leverage the release process. So you know, upstream, we're doing a lot of testing. You can take advantage of this as well. You know, if you file bugs, you can get upstream people to look at it. Um, this is, you know, obviously a great benefit. Um, and then also you want to keep monitoring the branch commits, see what's going in. Um, and this is mostly for people who might not necessarily use the upstream releases, but just to get an idea of what, you, know, you want to know what's going in, what kind of fixes are going in, because um, you may, like a, a good example of this would be, let's say you, you do a snapshots from trunk every six weeks. So maybe the bug that was found is in one of your snapshots, and because you're monitoring um, upstream, even though you branched a little bit early, you can say, hey, oh, this was fixed. This is also in my code, I can fix that too. So like I said before, just no matter what your release process is like or whatever your schedule is like, um, you know, there's benefits to doing this stuff and participating even if you aren't gonna use the final product that the upstream community produces. All right, and like I said, ways that you can get involved, um, filing bugs, testing, um, and probably the most important is uh, giving feedback on the release process. Um, so this is really a community-driven thing. I mean, the releases are really to serve the community. It's not like, you know, I just came up with this and it's what I wanna do. So if you have an idea or ways to improve the process, maybe you think uh, we should change up the schedule a little bit or we should support the stable releases for a little bit longer. Um, we wanna hear these ideas and we wanna talk about them because if there's enough people in the community that are interested, you know, maybe we can change the process a little bit um, or do something a little bit different uh, in the future. So some future improvements that um, I think we can do for the release process. Um, number one is find ways to reduce the burden on the release managers. Um, it's actually a lot of work uh, sometimes to track down all the, the different code owners, get the fixes merged. So really trying to encourage people to sort of take more ownership uh, of the process and sort of do their own um, merges, uh, get the attention of the code owners on, on their own. Um, that just helps. And especially if, we're, if we're, we are able to get more people involved in the process, that's really going to, uh, I think, increase the amount of work. So the more that uh, other people can do, the better. Um, also, just getting some better automation uh, for doing the merge requests. I mean, we have this kind of nice script. And I've been working on some other scripts to sort of um, update the Bugzilla. Uh, but we can always improve this, and this is one thing that would uh, make everyone's life easier, I think. Um, and also the GitHub migration. Uh, I think this is a pretty good opportunity for us to uh, maybe revisit the release process and look in some even uh, better improvements. I know GitHub has a lot of features like um, you, know, you can install hooks, um, trigger different CI jobs. It's just a little easier to work with. Uh, we still have to Actually, the main merge script still uses SVN uh, to do the merges, so uh, that's kind of a pain because you, you still need to um, check out the SVN source if you want to um, merge a fix into the release branch, so that's not really ideal. So uh, I'm really looking forward to soon when we can migrate to GitHub and start taking advantage of uh, some of these features. So I just before I close, I just want to say overall that um, 
I'm really excited about the release process and, and how well we've done so far. Uh, I think it's been maybe three or four years since we've um, been doing the stable releases, and I've really seen a lot of uh, growth in the interest and sort of the, the different users who are contributing. Um, but like I said at the beginning of my goal, I really want to get more people involved, um, mainly because it just helps with you know, getting better testing, uh, we can get more bug fixes, and I think that's something that we can really do to um, just help the, the, the project grow and sort of service the needs of the users a little bit better. So that's really all I have. Um, so I guess we'll now uh, open it up if anyone has any questions. Uh, thank you for presentation. And uh, actually, in ARM, we use one of your scheme. You are you were talking about. My question is uh, about Bugzilla. So currently uh, it's not used as it's supposed and uh, most of the people actually use Fabricator or uh, Lilium commits uh, mailing list. So what should we do to improve this? Uh, are you talking about like generally Bugzilla or like Bugzilla specifically for managing the releases? Uh, I mean uh, Lilium Bugzilla. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's a great question. I know in the people brought that up in the um, LVM board boff uh, that was earlier. I don't know what to do with Bugzilla. I mean, I've, I know that when I, I started using it for the stable releases a couple cycles ago, uh, and it's actually a big improvement to just managing things with email. So I actually sort of like uh, the Bugzilla, um, at least for what I use it for. Uh, and I can also interact with it with Python scripts, which is kind of nice for me. Um, but I know in general, sometimes it can be kind of a black hole for stuff. So yeah, that's a great question. I really don't know what's uh, the future of Bugzilla, but if you have uh, you know suggestions, that's something that you know, we can always discuss uh, on the mailing list. So uh, the problem is uh, I don't know how to encourage people to use this. So and I know our engineers also uh, overuse uh, Fabricator LLVM commits. Uh, so it's uh, because maybe we have internal Bugzilla uh, bug tracking system, but sometimes p people publish. I think I've seen in Apple commits uh, they pu publish the internal uh, error number and that's it, no information. Right. So and why nothing is uh, changing in this way? Yeah, and and actually one of the I actually sent a message to the mailing list about six months ago with some ideas about trying to embed information in like the commit message that might link back to a Bugzilla uh, bug. So maybe that's some way you can sort of make Bugzilla a little bit more useful. But it, it turns out that's kind of hard to do. Uh, there's this, it's just hard to get that automated to always work. So it didn't really uh, end up being something that was feasible. But maybe there's something else in that area that could be done. Um, but like I said, with the GitHub move, maybe that's an opportunity to look into some other things. I know GitHub has an issue tracker, mm. so we'll, we'll kind of just, I guess, maybe, have to see where yeah, that goes. Maybe GitHub uh, will fix all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, by ABI compatibility, do you what do you mean? Do you mean the Bitcode format or the textual IR grammar or? Right, that's a great question. Um, so what I'm talking about is like the libLVM.so um, shared object. Yeah. So that needs to remain ABI. So when we do like the 4.0.1 release, that shared object needs to be binary or ABI compatible with the 4.0.0. So people can just drop it in as a replacement um, and not have to recompile all their code. Um, but also things like bit code compatibility, like we're not going to, that's not going to break between a stable release and a major release. So, um, but yeah, I was talking specifically about the shared objects. Uh, in your presentation, I haven't seen uh, anything about uh, performance. So one of the uh, crucial part of uh, deciding to date, uh, to make a branch uh, is a performance perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what, is, what can you say? Yeah, I mean, so f usually for the releases, we don't really, once we make the branch, we don't really take any performance improvements or anything like that. So that's where if... Um, that's something that you're interested in. 
you're probably going to have to maintain your own branch and maybe you know just pull that into your own release. As far as like testing for performance, like I'm not really aware of anyone that's doing performance testing throughout the release process, but that's definitely something that someone was interested in. And one of the advantages of getting more people involved, we, you know, it'd be great to be able to take advantage of that. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker and thanks.